And uh, this is for anybody, but I'm kind of curious if you think that there are lessons that um, disability accessibility advocates in the United States can take from what you see in Russia. Are there are, are there areas? I mean, there's there's this tendency always to think that we're ahead of everybody else. We we've got it right. It's worth some. It's worth everywhere else. Are there things they're doing that you wish we had? I think um, you know, continuing what I said, unity and. Um, although there's a lot of disability advocacy groups in the United States, uh, a lot of them center around their own particular disability. You know, people who are deaf or people who are hard of hearing, which are two different communities, you know, strongly can advocate for themselves. And then there's other people with, you know, physical disabilities. And there's just, you know, a whole spectrum of people with different disabilities and, um, you know, in trying to advance their own you know, agenda, and unfortunately, sometimes it leads to, or there, there isn't this full unity that could be to accelerate the disability civil rights movement as a whole. That I think is John. If I can add something, yeah. Yeah, I think disabled people are as diverse as a population of able-bodied people, and in the U.S does not realize that. And also, in Russia, you saw many more programs featuring disabled people, the whole spectrum. Whereas here, there is kind of selective, or if it makes money, that's the driving force. So I think uh, we have to, we can be more diverse here and recognize that people are, disabled people are diverse as the major population is. And also, if I may add, um, it's easier to be disabled in New York than it is any place else in the country. In New Jersey, you take your life in your hands crossing the street. In New York, you know, people, they, they, they take it in their stride. And in Switzerland, they use walking poles long before they introduced them here. So anyway. The I, th I think that uh, one, one of the goals of working in media is to move uh, sensitivity to people with disabilities out of a special day, the anniversary. Mm -hmm of the ADA uh, law out of a spe special month, not Black History Month, uh, mm -hmm. and so that it's our, in our consciousness, just like we all interact with each other every single day. Otherwise, it's just tokenism. Sure, yes, and I'd like to add, I guess, uh, from the implementation side of things, we've seen, uh, you know, we've traveled to different um, events in both Russia and United States, been part of projects um, that have a disability focus in them. And, um, you know, we've witnessed ourselves that there are a lot of similarities, um, uh, there are some differences, um, but our key point is to be able to put U.S. and Russian people with disabilities, professionals working in the field together so that there could be that um, positive uh, kind of healthy exchange of best practices, resources, because we realize that everybody might do something really, really well in their own community, in their own uh, sort of pocket of things. But um, whenever you put people together, it just it, impossible things to happen. I feel like it's just it's been key to everything we do. Um, and being, I guess, Russian myself and, and seeing how things have evolved um, in the past in Russia, I must admit that um, I feel like there's also this, uh, like Jonathan mentioned, um, sense of community. There's a lot of uh, warmth, closeness. Um, I saw a lot of parents uh, and children with disabilities, uh, even children with disabilities sometimes are much older in their 20s and 30s, but there was a lot of um, activities that are surrounded um, uh, and, and uh, just focused on family and um, building those relationships. So um, I think maybe that's something that we can also try to integrate in the future in the United States. So like I said, there's always something to learn. Um, and uh, I think we need to continue doing what we're doing here. Um, I'd like to open uh, the questioning up to folks uh, in the audience. Um, and. Uh, if, if you have somebody specific you want to address your question to, please do that. Please uh, give us your name, um, and please do ask a question. So. 
Anyone? Please. And wait for the microphone. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the beautiful film. I am struck by um, just how beautifully, like the, the technique of it, the filming, the, um, the interpersonal connections that you helped me experience is just phenomenal. And I'm listening, uh, I have a lot of curiosity about inclusion because I, here in Washington, D.C., am a choreographer and theater director, and I have a what I like to call a matched ability theater company where professionals and uh, people with disability work together to create theater and then perform. And uh, here in the United States, we talk a lot about supported employment and uh, you know, so folks with disabilities can um, learn different job skills and then um, work in groups with a maybe a manager is is a decent expression for it. But what I notice is that people are trained to be janitors, um, work in the back of kitchens, do hospitality, and lots of other invisible jobs. And so what I'm excited about. Uh, is supported employment for people who want to be performers or want to be film directors or want to have a very active um, and visible place in our culture. So I'm wondering, and you know, I'm always watching for things that are happening in the, in the community around me that are doing that, but I'm wondering what you might have seen uh, in New Jersey and uh, in Moscow that I help people become employed in different professions and how people are accomplishing that. I could actually jump in, but uh, it's going to be kind of a New York based answer. So not Jersey, not Moscow, but uh, New York. So in the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, about a year ago, we launched a program called NYC at Work, and it's an employment initiative. So, you know, it is a problem, the idea that people with disabilities are fast-tracked to these very particular jobs that it's, okay, you can do this, so this is your job, no problem. But uh, at NYC at Work, we try and connect people with disabilities to their jobs that they want to do, not just you know, the, uh, the employment jobs that you specified, but really anything at any level. And the way that this is accomplished is through basically bridging the gap between businesses that are looking for people with disabilities and businesses not only, um, you know, ranging from like hotels to, um, you know, entertainment industry, the Manhattan Theater Club and other kind of arts organizations, then to uh, financial centers, basically organizations that are interested in hiring people with disabilities, interested in, in a more diverse workforce because diversity works because, you know, different backgrounds, different people with different personalities adds to productivity and efficiency within um you know uh, the the workplace. So that's that's the one end. On the other end, partnering with uh, career development centers. So things like CUNY Leeds, CUNY being um, the city college kind of network within New York City, and it's like their professional development center, as well as other kind of voc rehab agencies. So connecting the two pretty much and looking for qualified individuals with disabilities and connecting them and giving them the proper resources to do those jobs and not just not just focusing on you know transitioning youth and you know young people with disabilities, but really opening the door to every, anybody. Maybe it's somebody who was previously um, injured on the job and has been um, living off of benefits and wants to re-enter the workforce. Maybe it's somebody who has you know never been employed and is interested in entering the workforce. Really, there's no discrimination, but just kind of focusing on the person, thinking about you know what they can be given or provided with or, or training or whatever and then connecting them to you know, the resources they need to either get an internship or part-time employment or full-time employment. And for more extensive answers, I'd be very happy to connect with you afterward. Um, yeah, to, to uh, connect you with our employment coordinator who uh, started the whole program. And then John. Uh, could I, I, I'd like to give sort of a, a brief update on some of the stars in the film. Uh, John Novak, you all know the illustrious heights to which he continues to rise uh, and the inspiration that he's providing to everybody by the work he's doing. Donna is working here at our organization primarily in the human resource category. 
Ben is not here this evening uh, because Ben has a full-time job. Uh, he's an assistant video editor doing very, very good work, and he is in The Tempest tonight. Uh, he has a lead role in The Tempest uh, at the Flea Off-Broadway Theater Company, very prestigious uh, company. Um, and we can start going through the list. Miriam uh, graduated top of her class, uh, went on to law school, is graduating top of her class in law school. Uh, her dream has always been to go to Harvard, uh, and she's about a half an inch away from doing a postdoc in law at Harvard. Um, I think the, I, I don't want to take credit for this, but there is something about participating in this program um, that has helped everybody lift themselves up and then collectively lift everybody around them. And it's, it's really exciting to see what the participants are doing. Other questions? Uh, hi, John. <laughs> it's great to see you. My name is Marshall Vova, and I used to work at the American Embassy in Moscow and was to some extent involved in, in the project. Uh, now I'm here in Washington with the Voice of America. And uh, the question is about uh, Russian and American communities. To which extent you think are like societies, uh, people who do not have disabilities are aware and ready to participate and ready to support. Because uh, we know that after the very progressive uh, legislature on uh, inclusive education was adopted in, in Russia, there were serious conflicts between some parents uh, at uh, Russian schools who did not want children with disabilities in, in their schools and in uh, their like uh, kids' uh, classes. and. Uh, that was a, that was a big discussion in, in uh, Russian media. And uh, now living here in the States, I feel like American society is a lot more uh, engaged and supportive. Uh, do, do you think it's a matter of uh, like educating people or uh, what's, what's the difference, what's going on and what can be done? Thank you. Anyone who wants yeah. to I could take or a stab at it. Okay, <laughs> Lawrence, go ahead. <laughs> so I was just going to say that um, I guess what we've seen works really well is um, the social campaign, I guess. That's one way to kind of uh, break into the uh, audience and, and your everyday people and just to kind of show them that disabilities are everywhere in our life. Uh, and, uh, you know, the more people see and accept it as being part of the regular community, um, you know, everyday living, then perhaps less parents would be um, objecting their child having to be with a child who might be a little bit different. So um, I think it starts with the media and again, just kind of uh, being more in a, um, having greater visibility for topics like these uh, in, in our everyday life. Lawrence, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I wanted to say that the beauty of the format of partnership is not is that we're not trying to teach one side about the other and how to live, but it's a process of discovery. And each partner discovers something about the other, and it becomes so much more easy to assimilate what it is that you might, in your own, referencing your own situation, you might lack. But it becomes much easier to overcome your own sense of, well, why don't we have this, or why couldn't it be better? Instead, to look at this as a possibility and to open up new horizons for one's own thinking and not to, to look at oneself critically. You can look at oneself, one's own situation objectively rather than critically, and no one is there to try to teach. And uh, it's a far more successful format and it's one in which Russians and Americans in particular can thrive, and it takes out any degree of comparison, and uh, one is ahead, one is behind, and it turns it into the realm of, of mutual discovery. And I, we have found in, in many different areas of our work that this is the far preferred format for um, helping people, creating a platform where they, where they can discover one another. And inevitably, there are things to be discovered on both sides. I, as an American who lived in Russia for six years, I was amazed 
that we in the United States have not discovered that to cross from one in an in a, in a intersection, to actually cross with the hypotenuse of the triangle instead of crossing across one and then crossing across the other, but to cross across the hypotenuse is about half the time much more efficient and perfectly safe if you set up the lights this way. We haven't figured this out. But in Russia, on many, most intersections, they have figured this out. And I felt like I was violating the law and I was going to get hit by a car, but everybody perfectly understood this. This is just a small example of how my awareness continued to, to grow. No one taught me this. No one uh, sort of beat me over the head and said, why aren't you doing this? But I was like, well, oh. you know, I wonder what else I can discover here. And you know, the, the way the metro was run there. So there's many, many ways in which my own thinking keeps expanding and uh, it's fun. It, it makes it uh, exciting to discover that with someone else. And we saw in this film, it's captured everywhere. And the simple joys of discovering things together, the way that they were touching the sand together, experiencing the, the beautiful breeze and the, sun, the sunrise. And, I mean, it's, it makes it so much more meaningful. Things that you, you might take for granted, suddenly when you're doing this in partnership with someone else or with another group of people, become memorable unforgettable moments in your life. Hi. Um, so my name is Tatiana Legrand. I was born in Moscow, but I've been living now in the US for a while. So thank you, first of all, to every one of you, because I think it's a great, it, it's a wonderful movie. And from what I understood, there is a longer version of it. Or is that the kind of like the cut that you have now? And I'm just curious, I guess one thing is whether there are plans to make this movie more available. What is the future of the project, so to say? But also, I just want to say thank you to all of you, because um, I think the main difference that was really striking to me is the way that um, documentaries sometimes are made is um, in Russia, I did see one documentary about people with disabilities, and it was unfortunately kind of like just striking the sad notes. You know, it is well about the difficulties and about the, you know, the problems that with the legislation and all, you know, all the aspects that, that of course have to be talked about. But you know, like the, the I really enjoyed the uplifting stories, and I really. Thank you all that this was the, you know, the main part of the movie to me. Like I did cry through throughout the movie, but you know, it was, yeah, it was in a good way. So yeah, I guess the, the main question I have now, so what now? <laughs> How do you plan to make it more known? Because I want more people to get inspired too. Thank you. So we're trying really hard. I wish I had good news. I don't have good news yet. Uh, bad news is that we submitted it to public broadcasting for inclusion in the POV series. Uh, they considered it, tick tock, tick tock, and then they rejected it. So we got rejected two days ago. Uh, but today I was up at HBO and the head of uh, family programming um, has been supportive of the work that we do, appreciates the work that we do and Ben's father works for HBO. So um, we're holding our breath and hoping that we might get it included in the family programming at HBO. Um, I wish I had more contacts because I, I really do think that um, I, I agree with you, it would be great if more people could see it. Uh, we could easily get this distributed in Russia. I've just been waiting um, to try and figure out which network we want to get it uh, released on. Russia is going to be easier than the United States. Uh, but I just want to say that this has really shaped my thinking. Um, I forced my daughter to be the way I wanted her to be and made her do things that uh, she played hockey, she rode horses, she went to war zones with me, and I was trying to shape her in my image and in my conception of myself. And after working on this particular program, I have a grandson who is different. Uh, and I would have forced him to try and go into the same cookie cutter. Uh, and I really appreciate the wonderful differences that he has for me. Uh, and this program helped me understand that. I didn't understand it before. 
any other thoughts on distribution, other events that might show, people might be able to go? And also the question of the longer version, as I understand the longer version is that you can see the, vid the films that each of the filmmakers made on the website, is that correct? My fault, um, this is um, Oscar chasing. Um, I, I think that uh, a film about people making films to empower themselves, uh, makes it into a good candidate. You cannot compete in the long documentary category unless you have the backing of a network and a war chest of at least $2 million at this particular point. Uh, but the short documentary category is an accessible category. Uh, we are going to qualify this film so that it's eligible for Oscar competition. And unfortunately, the cutoff uh, for short documentaries is 40 minutes. Uh, so we compressed it. Um, once we get past that initial qualification, we can always expand it and open up the film again, especially if somebody wants to broadcast it. And, and the longer version has more of the films made by each of the participants? Yes, it does. And I believe each of the short films is available for viewing on DCTV's website. Is that right, John? Website. Is that right, John? That's correct, and all together, I think there are probably about 45 films. Um, every one of the participants, in order to be eligible for the program, had to make a film, and a lot of them are really good. You should know that John Novick's film here, by itself, which was about five minutes long, received something in the neighborhood of three million views. And, and still counting. That was maybe a year ago. Story, right? John. Uh, yeah, that was quite the experience. <laughs> and that was all thanks to this program and uh, the guidance of John helping me uh, kind of craft the story. And it's called uh, Don't Look Down on Me, which is, I thought, a very clever title because, you know. Uh, <laughs> and it's available on YouTube if anyone wants to see it, but also on DCTV's website. John became a uh, film st a star. He was recognized on the streets of New York there for that initial period. And maybe still, I'm not sure. Every now and then. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I'm Steve Legrand, and I just have a, I guess a bit of a follow-up question, and that is, so we watched tonight uh, a version of the movie that is uh, English subtitled for English speakers. And is there, there a Russian version that we can send to like family and friends uh, on the website? Or I haven't been to the website yet, but is there one available to, for the, a Russian speaking audience? Yeah, the, the film had its uh, cinematic debut at the Moscow Film Festival with Russian subtitles. Oh, so, so this version, uh, or it was, had Russian narration? No, we don't like uh, to overdub people because we want uh, to have people communicate directly in their voices. There were uh, Cyrillic subtitles. And uh, yeah, I guess just wanted uh, to add that there was a Moscow premiere of this film um, just uh, in April. Uh, none of us got to go, but John uh, did attend, and Dana, I believe, went as well. So um, I don't know if you'd like to share your experiences of screening uh, this film in Moscow and what it was like. Maybe that would be of interest. Well, Maybe that would be of interest. Well, I sat in the back because I couldn't get downstairs. But the the venue was so packed. Um, there must have been 500 people. And people were sitting on the stairs, and they were unwrapped. Um, during the Q&A period, though, uh, about a half of the people left, but they, people really were enwrapped with the film. And because I sat in the back, way up in the nosebleed section, um, people kept turning around and looking at me. So what, that was, that I felt really proud of that. Okay, John, stop it. I didn't say anything. <laughs> you looked at me like it, 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 it was a very, very nice screening. Uh, very, very well attended, uh, very emotional question and answer because oh, yeah. the Russian musketeers came from Sergei Posat to participate in it uh, and shared the stories of what has happened to them and what's happened to their community. 
And uh, one of the sponsors of the film, in addition to Eurasia Foundation, uh, Slava Fetisov, the Russian hockey hero, came and we presented him with a Musketeers uh, hockey jersey um, and uh, one for President Putin. I don't think that President Putin has um, received his Musketeers hockey jersey, but I was hoping somebody was going to ask me about this, which is my <laughs> hockey jersey from the <laughs> hockey game I played in with Putin with his signature right here. Um, what, what's interesting is that there's a consciousness at the highest levels of the Russian government about this program and what we're doing, and I think that's really exciting and very healthy. Other uh, questions? Any final uh, words, comments that folks want to make sure that the audience, both uh, here at CSIS and watching uh, from their computers, uh, walk away with? Um, so I think, you know, talking about media, talking about representation, and I think uh, of something that once I learned, I, I just carry with me everywhere, and it's, there's two different schools of thought when it comes to disability. So this is kind of getting into disability studies, and there's, there's um, the medical model and the social model. So the medical model is this idea that there's something wrong with a person with a disability, and it needs to be cured. So, you know, let's dedicate all of this time and all of this money to make sure that future generations do not have to worry about this disability, but not spending a dime on improving the quality of life of that person with disability, only focusing on the cure. And then the social model is the exact opposite of that. Looking at the disability, not that the person has a disability, but the environment itself has a disability, or the environment is the issue. And if we provide proper access and all the resources they need, they can live a full and fulfilling life. And I think this film really embodies that, you know, by looking at barriers in the environment and overcoming them through community and empowerment and, you know, just conversation, really. And it kind of having, having panels like this, showing films like this really embodies that. And I just like to point that out of like, you know, moving forward in, you know, your own positions, whether it be, you know, dance and theater, but how can you empower people with disabilities by removing barriers from their environment? That's it. I'd like to just say in closing. I, uh, sorry, Donna. Well, go ahead first. Go ahead. You're, you're from New Jersey. So am I, but. Oh, we are in New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. We're in New Jersey. Oh, oh Pansy. I, I belong to the Carter Theater, though. But anyway, I, I want to, first of all, thank the Raja Foundation, all the guys, for funding this really wonderful project. It was kind of the highlight of my life. And people here who are able-bodied thought it was the best thing that ever happened to them. People who saw the film relate able-bodied people related to things that maybe the disabled people were seeing for the first time, which goes to speak to something that John said, Jonathan Novak, about not using pity, but also use the experiences that we all have that are the able-bodied, disabled people, anybody can have. Anybody can touch the sand and feel how wonderful it is. Anybody can feel the breeze, feel how wonderful it is. But anyway, thank you very much, Raisha Foundation, for this opportunity. And thank ahead, you, CI, CSIS, for this opportunity to partner with you. And uh, I'm picturing, you know, when uh, Miriam talks about it, it was her dream to see the Brooklyn Bridge. There's something about that scene that just really, really moves you. And you think about how many bridges this whole film, this whole project is about all for one, one for all. And the bridge of the ninth century with eating s'mores, 
you know, uh, the bridge of Russia, Siberia, and New Jersey, and you know, uh, places in between. Uh, it, it's extraordinary how you just uh, you don't even really realize just how deeply it get, gets under your skin, and it affects you uh, in ways that you didn't even know you could be affected. So I want to thank John DCTV and um, Donna, John, Jonathan, Ben and all of the other actors, when I say actors, stars of, of, the, uh, of the film. I think this film is waiting to be discovered. I think it's a hidden gem, maybe not so hidden, but it's, it's going to be discovered and it's going to go viral. Just like John's five minute film, this film is gonna be that. And whether it hits the Kremlin first or the White House first, we're not sure. Maybe it will hit the summit if it ever happens. But uh, it, is, it is the very kind of thing that transcends all of the differences and it lets us see, be people who feel and love and appreciate and uh, connect in ways that, we, that have nothing whatsoever to do with the country we're from or what we walk in or, or, or ride in. But just by virtue of the fact that we're here on this planet, we showed up in the way we did, and can we find common ground, and can we find that place to open our hearts to each other? That's what this film is about. So we are all for one and one for all. Thanks. All right. So big thanks to all of you for joining us and for choosing CSIS to screen this film and uh, keep us posted on what we can do to support it. I, I, I found it um, just a great story, but also just really cool filmmaking. I, I loved how both the, the, the films, I mean, it is very meta, right? It's a film about making films, as John said, but it's um, also really, nicely done how it's all put together with both the story of uh, of this project and each of the stories of the individuals which they made pulled together. So thank you. <laughs>